All right, hey y'all, it's Miss Summers with your notes today. Today is the 24th of September, and we are looking at earthquakes. So we have, so far this unit, we've talked about continental drift and Pangaea, how we know that the continents all used to be together. We talked about the layers of the earth, the fact that those are different. We're going to come back to that today as well. We talked about the theory of plate tectonics and plate boundaries. We know what happens to different plate boundaries and we know how the plates move um, by convection currents in the mantle. And that brings us to today, earthquakes, okay? So earthquakes occur because of the things we've been talking about already, okay, the movement of the plates. We're gonna just be looking at the basics today, the parts of the earthquake, how we measure it. Um, and the different types of waves. All right, so we study plate tectonics, as I just mentioned, because earthquakes tend to happen at plate boundaries, okay? Major earthquakes are places that are prone to major earthquakes like Japan, Indonesia, um, California, Alaska, all right, all those places, South America, um, where the Andes Mountains are, all those places are on plate boundaries. So by looking at how plate boundaries work and by studying old earthquakes and past earthquakes, we can figure out how to better prepare for ones in the future. Okay, so what an earthquake is, it is a vibration within the crust. Okay, so it's energy moving through the crust when the rocks break or move suddenly because they're under stress. All right, so if you remember from plate boundaries on Friday and Monday, or last Friday and this past Monday, transform boundaries. At transform boundaries, the rocks slide past one another and they get stuck, okay? That, when they stick, all right, they're trying to still move, so pressure is building up, all right? When it breaks, there's your earthquake. This can happen at transform boundaries, but it also happens at convergent and divergent boundaries. It happens at any type of plate boundary, all right? Um, we describe the process of an earthquake in this, the elastic rebound hypothesis. All right, if you want to pause the video real fast, write this down. I have a demonstration for you afterwards. All right, so we're back. So the elastic rebound hypothesis says, you know, your rocks get stuck, stress builds up, the plates move really fast, and then the plates go back to being their shape. So I'm going to actually leave the PowerPoint for just a second, and I'm going to go, I'm going to bring the camera onto myself. Hello, everybody. All right, and I'm going to show you the elastic rebound hypothesis using these uncooked spaghetti noodles, okay? So I'm going to add pressure to these spaghetti noodles and add energy to them by pressing on these ends, okay? So you see how the noodles, they are changing shape. Ignore that that just happened. Okay, they're changing shape. Stress is building up. Now, once that stress becomes too great for that shape to be maintained, it snaps. Okay, that snapping is the earthquake. All right, and note that the spaghetti noodles, after they snap, they go back to being their original shape. All right, they're just broken now. All right, cool beans. So that's the elastic rebound hypothesis. Now let's look at I'm not going to make you draw that, unless you wish to. This is before, before at the start of the earthquake, before it, after. All right, parts of the earthquake. The focus, whoops, the focus and the epicenter. All right, so I don't have this written down, so you have to listen to me. The focus is the point below ground where the earthquake starts. So the focus is where the earthquake begins underground. It can be fairly shallow. It, can, it might be only, you know, a few miles beneath the surface, or it can be really deep. They can go up to 700 kilometers below the Earth's surface. After that, they don't really happen, all right? The epicenter, so the focus is where it starts underground. The only difference between the epicenter and the focus is the epicenter is on the surface. The epicenter is the point on the surface directly above it. All right, and that's what you need to know about focus and epicenter. All right, so an earthquake, when an earthquake happens, it releases these vibrations, this energy, 
and we call them seismic waves. All right, seismic waves circle out in all directions. All right, so not only are they gonna go like this way and that way, but they're also gonna go down into the earth. Seismic waves are very helpful. Um, if you'll recall from last Thursday, when we looked at layers of the earth, this is how we know what the inside of the earth looks like. We've never been to the inside of the earth. We look at how the waves move through the earth. That gives us a clue as to what it's made out of. All right, so our first way, there's three types, so you can make like a chart with three columns. That would be good. Our first wave is a P wave. We call it a P wave because it's primary. It gets there first. All right, the waves move in a push-pull motion, so that's another way you can remember, P waves. So it stretches and compresses. Imagine if you had a slinky and you bunched up one end of the slinky and let it go, that push-pull. Um, these P waves move through solids and liquids. So remember the inner, or not the inner core, excuse me, the outer core is liquid. We know that it's liquid because P waves can move through it. All right, and because these are the fastest waves, these are the first ones that are going to be recorded by a seismograph. Tomorrow, we're going to look at how we figure out how far away an earthquake is. We look at what time does the P wave get there. The P wave gets there first. All right. Our next wave is the secondary wave. S for secondary because it comes in second place. It's a slower wave. All right, so this is a side to side motion. So you can see here, instead of it being pushed and pulled in the same way that the wave is moving, it's going perpendicular. So it's going down and then up and down, but the wave is still traveling this way. All right, so it's kind of like if you took a jump rope and you flicked your wrist up and down, that's kind of what an S wave would look like. S waves only move through solids, so they do not move through the outer core. And because they can't get to the outer core, they can't get to the inner core either. All right. Um, again, S waves are slower. They reach the seismograph second. All right. And when a P and an S wave get to the surface, they become our last kind, which are the L waves. So you can think of L for last. L for last, they are the slowest. Um, the L actually stands for love. Oh, is that nice? Because it's named after a person, not because these are nice things. L waves have a mixture of that push-pull and side-to-side. -side. It's like a rolling motion or a twisting motion. These only travel on the surface and they reach the seismograph last. Um, because they have this twisting, rolling motion, they cause the most damage to buildings, all right? So the main danger in an earthquake is not the earthquake itself. It's being, it's being crushed by something that's falling down, like a piece of furniture or a part of a building, all right? So we have our P, S, and L waves. You can remember P, S, L, like pumpkin spice latte. Those are coming back. P is primary, it's fastest, S is secondary, it's slower, and it goes side to side, and the L waves are last, and they roll. Okay, so that's the parts of the earthquake. Those are the types of waves. Lastly, we want to know how do we measure an earthquake. So we are going to measure an earthquake on something called the Richter scale. There's actually two ways to measure it. The Richter scale measures how much energy gets released. So if you've ever heard, um, if you've ever heard like watch documentaries on things and they're like, you know, the energy released is equivalent to this many atomic bombs. That's kind of what the Richter scale is doing. Um, so the scale goes from 1 to 10. Um, there's actually never been a recorded magnitude 10 earthquake that's never happened on Earth. As far as we know, it could have happened, but we weren't around to see it. Um, but this is a logarithmic or exponential scale. 
So the difference between a 1 and a 2, a 2 releases 30 ti 32 times more energy than a 1. A 3 releases 32 times more energy than a 2. A 4 releases 32 times more energy than a 4. So by the time you get to these big numbers like 8, 9, and 10, that's an incredible amount of energy. They don't happen very often. You don't need to write this, but um, I like I like mentioning this diagram because it has a lot of information on it. So we have number of earthquakes in the middle, the magnitude over here on the Richter scale, and then the energy release. How many kilograms of explosive would you need to make the same size earthquake? So as you can see, the majority of the earthquakes are under a magnitude two. Most of them you don't even feel. Um, so they happen literally all the time, mostly around plate boundaries. All right, as you go up, the number of earthquakes decreases. So magnitude threes, they happen pretty frequently, 100,000 times a year. But look how much more powerful these two are, or this one is from this one. A magnitude two is the equivalent of taking 56 kilograms of TNT and putting it underground and blowing it all up. A magnitude 3 is taking 1,800 kilograms. The next one up is 56,000. This is 1.8 at a magnitude 5. All right, so that's the exponential that I'm talking about. Um, the highest earthquakes that have ever been recorded are in the mid-9s. We had a 9 point, I think this one in Chile, the biggest one ever was like a 9.6. We had a 9.4 in Alaska and then in Sumatra. I know y'all weren't alive for this for the most part, um, but this caused that really horrible tsunami that killed like close to like a quarter of a million people. It was a 9.3. All right, so you can imagine how powerful a 10 would be. It would be even bigger. All right, so that's the Richter scale. Our last scale, our, the other scale I want you to know, is called the Mercalli scale. All right, Mercalli's just named after somebody. The Mercalli scale measures the intensity of the earthquake based on how much damage it did. All right, so this was like a little mini from 2015. Um, there was an earthquake in Washington, D.C. It was really small. It wasn't really big, so people were like joking. They're like, oh, look how much earthquake damage the earthquake did, you know, and since other earthquakes like this one over here, unfortunately, is a lot worse. All right, you don't need to memorize the Mercalli scale. All right, I know this is a horrible picture. I'm sorry about that. Um, but just know the bigger the number is, the more damage is done. So a, a modified Mercalli 1 is something that you wouldn't even notice as a person. Uh, a machine would be able to detect it, but you wouldn't. Um, that earthquake we had right before, right before um, school started this year, it was up in the northern part of the state but we, a lot of people felt it here, it would have probably been a Mercalli 3 or 4, all right? Nothing crazy. You notice things are kind of swinging, and you kind of feel a little something, but things don't fall down or anything like that, all right? Um, yeah. So, bigger numbers, more damage. So, in these notes, we talked about the elastic rebound hypothesis, we looked at the difference between a focus and an epicenter. We looked at the three different types of seismic waves. You really, really need to know the difference, so I would definitely study that tonight. And we talked about the difference between the Richter scale and the Mercalli scale. All right, tomorrow we're going to continue talking about earthquakes. Uh, so please be ready for that, especially with your waves. And I will see y'all tomorrow.